13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age Bill, I, I said it at the end, I love this one. This was a fun one. This, this, was, this was good. This, this was one of my favorite episodes, and it came out of nowhere. Um, guest had great credentials, looked really impressive, but, you know, I don't want to get my expectations up too high. I did that once with Men in Black and was very disappointed. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it, was, it was really awesome to talk to, uh, to Mattis. Tonight's interview, by the way, is with Mattis uh, Miller. And, Bill, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just going to keep Matt. dropping compliments here, sure. unless you jump in and no, help me. Go. Yeah, no, uh, Mattis Miller is a psychotherapist. And uh, he he is he he got in contact with us via Kitcaster. So um, this is the second episode that we've had a guest on that that reached out to us. And um, I don't know. I think it was the the agency that reached out on his behalf. Um, but anyway, it it turned out great. I've always been leery of that in the past and, and yeah. rarely disappointed, but it's just one of those, it's kind of a question mark. You worry about, mm-hmm. you know, commercialism and, but Mattis was just genuine. He, he was more honest with the questions than anybody else on the show or at least equal. And it showed mm-hmm. it, like, yeah. I, I'm still thinking of comparisons and th- we went into just what he was doing with therapy and what I used to do with getting information from people who had stolen and seeing that duality, you know, of being able to both get information, but get information from somebody and help them with it and see truths that they're not able to see to reflect back to them, to, to bring them to a better place. And it was really, really fun to make the connections between two completely different worlds that have the base set of tools and um, they're doing the exact same thing. An interrogation is the same as a therapy session, but instead of, you know, just extracting information for action, you're extracting information for reanalysis for somebody else to see a new perspective of that information and then help them with it. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing that, I don't know, I'm just reeling this all over in my mind, like connections between persuasion, this yeah. therapy and all the, how you can take things that have, you know, negative slants and negative aspects or negative things that can be utilized and, and flipping it on its head and seeing all the incredible power that can be given to this. If you, you know, accept, accept the change, right? So that's what therapy is. You, you know, you're, you're accepting that you're going to have somebody help you make the change because it's, it, I don't know, it, this was a great episode. I'm, I'm repeating the whole episode, but we got into communication and yeah, I, I love this one, Bill. I love this and one. What it reminded me of is the role that a shaman takes in guiding someone to, through help, you know, through mm-hmm. whatever it is they're dealing with and connecting them with themselves, getting to know themselves better in their relationship with other people in the outside world and with a higher power. So to me, that was, it's just, this is just a different flavor of, of that. Oh, he's great too. Helping people. And so. not even helping people. He wants, I mean, he's talking about like, yeah, this is how you help people and you help yourself, but this is how, how you also implement this with rearing and raising children and you can pass on these traits and, you know, then you're not undoing things. And, you know, tying them up better, you're constructing solid foundations. And so, yeah, I, 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 the tools to, to further, to further that, that healing, you know, and that, that way that, that healthy lifestyle and way of existing. I mean, that's, it's exactly, you know, teaching a man to fish and, and, and giving him a fish and, and doing that for your children, teaching them how to fish metaphorically, you know, just makes the, world they have a leg up you know right oh. off the get-go and it just makes the world a better place in the future generations when you're not around anymore so like parent yeah the pa- whole parenting aspect of it is super super interesting uh angle to it yeah 
Well, a super interesting man, highly intellectual, very well-rounded, a lot of experience with rearing, raising, um, therapy. I just, this was, what am I trying to say here? I was trying to make a specific point. Pleasantly surprised. No, it was, um, what was it? It was that. Well, I was just going to make the comment about. Oh, I do remember. Okay. It's going to sound cheesy. Just that, you know, what he's doing is very beautiful. He's a family man. His family is center. He's putting these tools and, you know, things that he's doing into his own life. He wants to teach other people how to better their life. Like, he truly is a human being that is just trying to improve the garden. He's trying to build a better world, and he's trying to do it, you know, with his children and with people and with helping people grow and get over depression and, you know, face inner traumas and find different ways of allowing themselves to heal and find new direction. And I mean, it's really cool when you see somebody like that um, in the world. And I don't know, we were very blessed to to interview him. And again, I'm rambling, but I was super, super happy and surprised with Mattis. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great conversation. You guys will definitely enjoy it. What else do we have on the docket? Let's see. Well, Social? let's give a let's first give a link out to Mattis Miller's website. And that is the uncontrollablechild.com. Yeah, I was uh very happy to hear that uh we were the uh the podcast that stood out in the questions list. Yeah, that was cool. We got some a little bit of feedback towards the end of the the interview and i guess that uh he he did a number of them earlier in the past month and then ours kind of stuck out which is good because we want to be noticed right so that was some nice feedback from from a guest if you need to sit back and look at the questions and they make you a little anxious and you got to keep reading them ah, that that's the biggest compliment that we can ever get And I'm glad that he took the time because, again, you know, I might be the host, but I mean, when I'm on here, I'm the guest. This is going to be one, uh, Bill, I'm probably going to ask to edit this one. And just, I want to listen to it in depth again, because, you know, sitting here doing technical things in the background, I'm I'm 90% in it. And this is one that I'm just looking forward to diving back in and listen to. It's going to be an evergreen in my book. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Um. So that was the uncontrollablechild.com was his website. You can find his, his book there. And uh, as far as, I don't know, socials for our show, um, our, we still have the Discord channel. That's all these you can find in the, in the show notes. We have Discord, Telegram, uh, Gab. Uh, those are all just different ways to reach the show. Uh, the email 13 questions podcast at gmail.com. It's one three questions podcast. And we we did have a little bit of interaction in, in Discord. We've got a listener, Shellback, that wants to to talk. He wants to be on the show. And he's got a pretty hey, he he's part of the Gramerica community, right? So I kind of have an uh, an idea of of the person uh, already. So we'll probably have him on, but that won't be for bill. I defer to you, your superior, uh, guesting ability. Yeah. Well, I mean, you defy all odds. You are the opposite of the cooler at the casino. You're like the, the podcast hotter, <laughs> but he, he's, he's already got the end being part of the community there. So but that won't be for another. He, yeah, he's still in active duty, so we have to to wait till that's finished. So that won't be for a while. But yeah, I mean, that's just an example of how you can directly interact with with the with us and and other listeners from the show on Discord. Go check it out; it's a cool place. And uh, if you like memes, uh, that's where I keep. Uh, Gab is where I keep all of our memes. I have made about like seven hundred posts, I think. So the last time I checked. And it's mostly, it's just memes that I find and I share. And of course, I post episode updates there also. So if you're looking to get a hold of us, that's how you do it. 
I would like to talk a little bit of shop, though. Yeah. This episode, actually, I think is going to have a return to good, or at least by my standard, better audio. I've been getting that terrible feedback on my end. I thought it was a chord, and ultimately, I guess it could be. Uh, I'm getting some wicked RF, but anytime I pipe, either out of my external uh, audio for my monitor or my uh, directly out of my keyboard, anytime I'm piping that audio, um, I'm getting feedback. But if I go directly through my mixer, the feedback is completely eliminated. So for this episode, um, I realized that. Uh, shame on me, I was setting everything up with the air conditioner running before, and I couldn't hear the hum in the background until I turned onto the podcast, so I thought it was connections, and going into this episode, I've got everything unplugged, disconnected, no transformers plugged in on my system, I had LED lights off, I was trying to zero everything out, and then I was like, oh, maybe I'll try this setting again. So, I am proud. One day we will get you a mixer, and your audio sidelined with mine will be superior. And then when we have an amazing guest like this tonight, whose audio was really good. Really good. And uh, also uh, proof that he has a very large family. And yeah, I, I so, mean that as a complete co compliment, by well, the way. <laughs> because, oh my god, like Luna has done more to disrupt podcasts than that. Luna's my cat, by the way. Yeah, the uh, audio quality. I don't know, you... I don't forget which episode it was that you edited, but I just noticed that the, you, there's two little tricks that I, I didn't know then, but I know now what you did. And I'm telling you, like the, the audio quality for, I don't know, in my opinion, that, that we have is, you know, pretty good compared to some of the other podcasts I listen to on the rig. So I'm learning. I'm learning. And uh, if you're, anybody you're out an audio there, wizard. look, I'm willing to help anybody out there. Hit me up in the back end of the discord. But it's pretty simple. Um, I mean, I've learned from a lot of other people, a lot of Studio One videos. But essentially, I take and at the end of our show, I run all of our files through Alphonic. It's an $80 program that you can download for uh, Mac or PC. And that does a whole bunch of things. I can choose what audio levels to bring it up to. It does pre-processing, pre-compression. Um, it does a top end. It does a low end. I got a hum filter control the luffs on it. It's super, super controllable. I use it almost in default setting and just run the files straight through that once. Then I bring it back into Studio One. I add a compressor. I add an expander. I add a leveler to it and I watch it live. And while I'm doing this, I'm just seeing, making sure that my levels don't go too high. And um, that's really the magic. Aside from all the clipping in between, the pulling out the pops, the pulling out the smacks, you know, between the compressor, the expander, I mean, I'm really taking all that bottom end sound out so you're not hearing the low end hums and frequencies, um, at least as much as, as humanly possible, plus what, you know, Alphonic is really good. So it's just this kind of mixture of things, but it's nothing crazy. Yeah, so we can help you with your your audio if if you were to submit it for an episode so that is want, the best way to, to say it. and look i'm gonna have a good test on here on a few episodes that are in the bank that we haven't gotten out because like i said i've got that horrible rf and we're gonna see if i'm gonna be able to pull that out as beautifully as i think worst case scenario look we go to what us podcasters are best at and that is backups and Bill's got a backup and I've got a backup. So uh, it might have, and even though I say I'm compressing everything on my end, it's a different type of compression. Um, I'm doing a more precise compression. Zoom is compressing for overall data. I export very large data files. I record in like a 32-bit WAV file coming in directly to SD card. I do everything in WAV. And then on the final export... After all these compressions in between, that's when I do the final MP3 out. Um, and, you know, not that anybody in the audience notices or even cares, but, you know, that I always keep, you know, the music in the beginning, stereo, the music at the end um, is in stereo and full, you know, quality. That's not getting any of that compression. I keep it on a separate track. So you're hearing, you know, what Superman put out for purchase for MP3. Um, and allowed us to use for the show. So I, I always make the distinctions and put the compression in. I hope you guys notice. I really want you to have a non-ear bleeding experience. And I, I certainly know as a podcaster, um, as the quality and fidelity goes up, it becomes easier to listen to, becomes a more engaging experience. And, you know, let's be honest. Uh, we want to do the best at what we can. And why not? 
Yeah. So if you're worried about the quality of your recording, if you have done one of these with somebody that you find that's a role model, don't worry about it. We've got some tricks up our sleeves that mm-hmm. we can pull. But yeah, this is uh, open source. Uh, at least we're trying to make it open source as much as possible. Uh, so if anybody out there has anybody in their life, a like role model that they would want to sit down and ask any of these 13 questions to, um, maybe we'll f- publish a list Listen, on the website so they can pick and choose. If you've sat down to ask or, somebody these questions and you've come up with questions on your own or you asked additional questions, even if you didn't record it, send it to us. Uh, I'm really hoping Matt sends some our way. I uh, I love the his structure of mind and the way that he puts things together and thinks. So, um, especially when you know he said that these are these are things that that he's thought about and ways of thinking, and and I find that so fascinating because there's so few people that can live in that space. So yeah, send that send it our way. Send it our way. Um, ultimately all the wisdom in the show is, is, is extracted and rooted out and grown from those questions. So, you know, let's, let's grow some new branches, some new species in different directions. Uh, give us a question. Yeah. Be a part of the magic or, uh, just send a guest suggestion. If you know somebody that you think would be interesting that we don't know about, let me know and I'll reach out. And, uh, that, I guess it, that kind of leads us into, I don't know, do we have a gratitude segment that we want to do? Oh, perfect. Gratitude, 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 oh, gratitude. Gratitude, 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 oh, gratitude. So, Bill, I hear you have a gratitude. Yeah. And I thought about this before the interview today, actually. So, but it ties in, like it just tied in way too well. So super excited to share it with you guys. But it it was, it's this video that I posted today in our Discord chat. I think it's in the health and fitness room. Today's May 5th. So you're probably going to have to go back to that date and look for it. But it's a Greg Braden video. Greg Braden is uh, a guy whose work I've just recently been kind of looking at. Anyway, he, he gives in this video, it's maybe about a half hour long. He, he just gives a little meditation about how to uh, drop into the heart mind frequency. It's 0.1 hertz, apparently, is the frequency that, that you kind of enter into when you, um, I don't want to say like unify or, or make coherent your neurons in your brain with the neurons in your heart, and then you. You slow down your breathing, which sends this message to your body that uh, you're in a calm, peaceful state. And, uh, and then you think about gratitude. And, and gratitude creates that point 0.1 hertz frequency. And uh, you do that, for, you'll do that for like three minutes a day. And then uh, I just think that it's, it, first of all, it fit in way too well for what matters is answers. And then, uh, Number two, like it's just we talk about gratitude all the time, and that's something that Greg hits on pretty consistently too. Uh, there's a f- few other words that he uses besides gratitude, but that is one of them. The other ones are love and, and attention. I can't, I don't remember exactly what they are, but um, it's it's all talking about the same frequency. So yeah, um, that's just something I think that I'm going to try to to incorporate into my daily routine that i have when i get up in the morning so yeah if you guys want to check that out um it's it's super easy to do and i don't know i think it's going to benefit me so that's why i thought i would want to share it well thank you for doing that mr bill no i mean that it's uh it's something that we should do more often is is share those things that that we find beneficial or grateful for it's uh I don't know, man, you can stoke somebody else's fire, start a wildfire. Yeah. And that's kind of like the whole idea behind discord, right? I mean, it's just a place for people to, to share ideas and to drop links or videos that you think that are interesting. That's pretty much the only way it's what I use it for, but I'm the only one really in there dropping links and whatnot. And there's a few people that are put some songs in there every now and again, but yeah, I'm getting off topic. Uh, yeah. Gratitude. You check it out. It's in the health and fitness channel. May 5th, Greg Braden.
Did you have a, a gratitude for? Yeah, I do. And I was actually looking it up and this is going to sound like the stupidest thing to ever say, recommending from watching five minutes of a video. Um, but I don't know if you're familiar with Darren Brown. He is a mentalist and he does some pretty incredible things. But the things that he's doing is really just, well, I'll give you an example. One of the things that they did on the special, and I watched 13 minutes of it before I had to go to work today. So it's on my list of things to complete, but I've been a fan of his. And just as we talked tonight, you know, I'm fascinated by um, patterns of thinking, way pe ways people think, the ability to um, direct a person's thoughts and walk them down certain avenues and get them to s see things from your perspective using techniques that are outside of their normal purview. And one of the things he does is saying, hey, I'm going to select a person from the audience and I am going to write down a word on a piece of paper. And I'm going to put it in this envelope. Now, um, and then he goes through this whole spiel, this whole spiel about different things. Um, I should also say one of the things he did to select people is he said, oh, I want a person from this age who makes this amount of money, who's done this, who's been in um, at least, you know, a, a long-term relationship of two years or more. And then he brings the person up. And as he's talking, he's, he's doing all these things and he's talking and he's saying things to stress him out. And he's going through just this list of things. It's this dialogue. And at the end of it, um, he, you know, asked the guy to open up the envelope. And on the inside of the envelope, he has written out exactly everything that he's going to do on this, this time here at this place. I'm going to go and ask an audience member this question. I'm going to have them do exactly this. And then I'm going to say this. And he goes through describing exactly all the things he does to preset your mind of a certain type of individual so that he knows that you're going to choose the word. I won't reveal what it is. I'll leave it as a, well, I guess if you watch it, um, it's the word film and the guy writes down film, but was he really a mentalist in this? No, he was implanting this way of thinking this word without a person realizing they were doing it. And he did that through a whole bunch of suppositions and a whole bunch of other things, but and it kind of came up in this and maybe it's because it's been on my mind when we did the interview, but he's like, everybody thinks they're living inside their own head. And they don't realize that nobody else thinks about them as much as they think about themselves. And when you start to realize that other people think in a very similar manner and we have very similar inputs and you can start exploiting those without a person understanding how patterned and how ritualistic in these ways of their I mean, he thought he came to a conclusion on a random word. He's asked to change the word over and over again while he's doing it, but still lands on the destination point. And for me, watching that, understanding that about myself, that about my innate ability or my unaware ability to extract or not extract, but implement or use that with other people it's so powerful on so many levels. It's very humbling. It allows you more maneuverability and control in your world, especially if you're trying to do in the therapy way or in the persuasion way of like, look, we have a beneficial goal over here. And I think if you can see it from a perspective that I think you'll find beneficial, then maybe we can come to an agreement. And, you know, for that, that 13 minutes and I can't speak for the rest of it, but just having that, that reinvigorated perspective that, yeah, you can be duped in that way and you can dupe other people, but when you're aware of these things, it gives you so much power of control and understanding of what could be done, right? So, I don't know, just in a way, if you're aware of these deep patterns, you can break them and it was cool. By the way, recommend anybody check out Darren Brown. Um, uh, I, 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 He's taught me so much about human beings. Yeah, learning. I mean, people are interesting. Learning how pe what makes people tick mm -hmm. on the inside. I mean, that was. I won't say anything more about the interview, but yeah, that comes up too. The whole mentalism thing just really uh, reminds me of uh, Penn and Teller's uh, a TV show that they had, where the magicians get up there and they do their trick, and then Penn and Teller will like figure it out, and then they'll tell the magician like they knew how they did the trick and like if they tricked him or not 
or what but all a magician is doing like stage magician is is manipulating people's perception like they're not really making the the rope that you cut back into like two you know the single the same pieces right i mean so yeah understanding how people work and uh, what makes them tick and like the little little quirks and like the body language which we kind of touched on a little bit like and what that tells us about people and like, i don't know yeah it's just fascinating like how uh, finicky weird little things can give away about us well, if anybody wants general, wants right. to take a deep dive into that perception angle, there is um, a gr- – I'd be willing to call him the greatest card magician of all time, greatest cardist of all time. Uh, his name's Richard Turner. There's a great documentary on him called Delt. It used to be on Hulu, and he's a blind magician. He does cards, and he is completely blind. He wakes up, he's shuffling cards. He goes to bed, he's shuffling cards. That's all he does is move and play cards. And when you start to understand that he has a perception of the world where he knows where every single card is, where every single possible angle could be for the perception to be, to be, you know, for the card, for you to, like the amount of detail. Now, he did learn a lot of this while he had partial vision, but he is a master at controlling your perception while having none of what you have in sight. So he can't tell if nobody's looking at the cards. He always assumes that everybody's looking at the cards. He has to assume all angles of possible view. It's an amazing... So I don't know where I was going or connecting with this, but if you're into cards or you're into documentaries, uh, it's a really fun one. Yeah, throw a link in the Discord. I'll check it out. It sounds cool. Um, but yeah, we are a value for value show here. So if uh, if you guys are getting any value, somebody can fix. Sorry, I well, was going to put the link in the Discord, and apparently I'm playing the link. It's all right. I was just asking for money, so we can do that as much as we want to, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so value for value, guys. We have uh, a monthly or one time option to donate via uh, PayPal on the website. Um, if you are in the market for a Shungite, if you happen to be looking for some of that, we have an affiliate link on our website that you can use that'll give us 10% back. Uh, Adam and I both wear Shungite, so we wanted to uh, extend that offer and share it with our listening audience because we both have found uh, benefits from wearing the stone. Uh, some people say that it uh, helps with EMF uh, protection. Um, I just like the, the uh, grounding aspect uh, that, that I feel from it physically it just makes me feel calmer and uh, kind of like I'm on Island time, which is nice. No, that's that's a good way. I, I describe it as just a, a a light weight lifted off my chest. Like I'm just there's a pressure that disappears, and strangely enough, somewhere near the end of the day, I get anxious with it, and it starts bothering me, and I feel it around my neck, and I pull it off, and I feel just as calm afterwards. So placebo or not, I've given the example before. I and found out on this podcast, I, I've been a crystal wearer nonstop for most of my life with my quartz watch. So my quartz crystal is also telling time. So what else could my shungite be doing that science has not yet discovered yet? So I'm feeling an intrinsic feeling from it. Um, so I'm going with it. I trust my own instincts. Mr. Gut. Trust my oh, second junior. brain. So yeah, if you're into Shungite, check that out. There's a whole uh, FAQ page that uh, Derek Condit has on the on the website about Shungite. So you could really do some digging around in there if you're super interested into that or super interested about that. And um, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, lastly, if, uh, if you don't want to do any of that stuff, uh, at least share the show. Share it with somebody that you think uh, would benefit from listening to one of the guests um, or uh, yeah, share the show. Share the show. This and and especially this one. I had fun with this one. It was it was good. It was it was a fun surprise. Uh, Mattis is awesome. I do hope we cross paths in the future. 
So, Bill, uh, you got anything else for us before we fly on into uh, the interview with Mattis Miller? Oh, yeah. Uh, Review the show, guys. I was poking around the internet today looking at trying to find our podcast reference on different sites. And uh, I came across the Apple one. And I think the last review is from, like, last year. And it's halfway through this year. So, yeah, if anybody wants to, like, review the show on any websites that they use i guess apple is the big one that would be super neat of you and kind of you to do that's the that's the last thing i had to add we can get into the interview now yep and uh i'll throw this out there if anybody has expertise in setting up a lightning node or anything to integrate with podcast 2.0 so that there can be a value for value so she uh, cryptocurrency it's very cool um, not a lot of people are aware, but uh, Apple did a big faux pas. They introduced a new monetization thing where you could have people subscribe to your podcast. If you implemented that, it delisted you from the regular podcast Apple feed, which is what most podcasts pull from. And there's no current way that I'm aware of that that's fixed. I don't know if Apple is going to fix it, um, which means that there's a lot of shows that are just no longer available and showing up in the iTunes uh, list. But fortunately, um, Adam Curry, uh, host of MoFax or co-host of MoFax and co-host of uh, the No Agenda Show podcast, and as many may know him from MTV VJ and a on the ground level, call him the pod father, the podcast inventor, developed the protocols, had the vision, did all the networking. Um, very important person um, in this area. Anyways, uh, he is spearheading podcast 2.0, which is a new list that is also tied to a bunch of cool things, a bunch of new features. Apple has not been innovating. They are. Um, changing a lot of things, a lot of things that you're doing, adding transcripts, adding donations, adding links, adding photos. There's a bunch of cool podcast apps out there doing this. Um, in fact, when I do this, I'm going to put a podcasting 2.0 link that's going to show podcast 2.0 compatible apps. I super believe in this. I've been listening to podcasts about it. I want to implement it. I'm already knee deep in podcasting. And some of this is a little bit beyond my technical, technical, the ability to say technical and abilities and my, uh, time. So if anybody out there is doing it or familiar, um, Help me, help you, I'll help Grime America, and uh, we'll all be better for it. So value for value. Help us help you. And if uh, nobody understood anything that I said, that's okay. Listen to the podcast, Podcasting 2.0, and you can learn about the new standard. See, I'm already promoting other people. My gratitude is their ability to help me, and maybe I can help them. Yeah, that sounds exciting. I'm, I'm not too familiar with, with it, but if you're if you're behind it, then... I'm oh, it's, it's essentially just another free list and they've another got, list. they've got a bunch of really cool ideas and things that they've implemented. And well, as far as like the whole crypto, like being able to share amongst, well, look, here's the problem. Okay. You want to donate through Patreon, through PayPal, through all these other systems right. and places and people are getting demonetized. They're getting delisted. You know, you lose access. Well, with a podcast, you have an RSS feed. Well, if that RSS feed is open and anybody can grab it and their idea is, Hey, we want to create a list that is not censored you know censored to them is going look back in the 90s the atheists were being censored now look who's being censored it's always going to shift we want to create something that's going to be a record of time you know they're they're implementing all these new features and these new tags and new abilities and working with all the podcast um hosting companies out there trying to really push and they're doing it that's the cool thing yeah it'd be super cool to be a part of if we can get the our own little node set up yeah, and that's also the beautiful thing because it's a true value for value. Somebody could be listening to the episode with Mattis Miller and really like something that's going on and boost it. Right now, it's running through like a Sphinx chat. So you have a Sphinx fat chat that's tied to your your Lightning node, tied to your your Soshi crypto coin, which is you know it's we're working there. This is the early stages of trying to create a true value for value system. And here's the beautiful thing, Bill. So I'll give you the no agenda show um, <clears throat> uh, thing. So what they do is for their feed, they've already said, look, you can change any of these tags, but if you're getting donations to your show with the node system, we can automatically divide that up 
in a percentage to other people. So yeah, you have somebody that's putting chapters into your shows that has links, that has photos that are coming up, that has, you know, resources that, you know, they're acting as a producer. There's somebody that's trusted that you're checking off or giving them full access to upload these links. Now I can say, man, you know, you're really valuable to my show. I'm going to automatically 5% of anything anybody donates goes directly to you. Well, this is beautiful. Now we're taking out the third parties. We're taking out the ability to delist. Look, I've got a crypto coin. I'm sending it directly to you. I can load in real money through this other system and you can extract it on the other end. We're taking out the banks. We're doing it instantly. Oh my God, I really like this spot. I'm going to boost you up. I'm going to give you extra points here. And you can define what those are. It could be cents per minute. It could be dollars per minute. You could say, oh my God, these guys are amazing. We really need to keep this going. I love what they're doing. And you could boost them up 20, $200, whatever value you find, whatever number is important to you, whatever you feel you're getting out. And it's just such a beautiful way of, of integrating the system to take out the third parties, to just bring it back to offering that value. And it's a complicated system right now. You do need to set up a node and all these other things. And so, um, yeah, if anybody out there, um, can help or is already doing it or can link me to good information, um, then I plan on getting there. I plan on taking us there. Um, I really should, right? I mean, we got Grimerica, we've got myself, we've got uh, 13 Questions, we've got my personal podcast. Um, so you would be doing so much good um, out there. So anyways, value for value. I'm stealing it right from Adam Curry's mouth. It's time, talent, and treasure. And you know, we, we can't do it without the listener. We can't do it without the listener support. We certainly wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't be able to do the hosting fees. We wouldn't have been able to do the $300 file transfer fee. That's all because of people and their long-term support and donations. And, um, the more you help, the more we do, the more we grow, the better we sound. And again, that's not through, you have to help us with money. No, we're here for you. And we value you. I don't know. We'll cut all that little bit at the end out because it sounded stupid, but. Well, no, we, we love you guys. We appreciate you guys. Uh, hope you enjoy the chat with Magis Miller. All right, Mattis, you uh, you ready to go? You have any questions for us go. before we dive in? Awesome. Let's dive. What was the best advice ever given to you? And would you modify it at all today? So it might sound a bit cliche because I am a psychotherapist. And uh, actually from a very young age, I was, a, a, I would say probably in my late teenage years, and perhaps we'll get to it later on in the questioning, I realized that I had certain capability uh, strengths related to interacting with others, understanding others. And there was a part of me that thought about the field of psychotherapy, psychology, social work. I was indecisive. I wasn't sure. I didn't know which path I wanted to take. It's a lot of back and forth. Should I go? Should I go for my master's? Is this what I want? Um, and I went to a, someone in my community who is a, someone of great stature. Um, well, going back, I was probably about 20 at the time. And I asked him, I asked him, should I do this? And he said it, his response was with such clarity and decisiveness that absolutely. And again, perhaps we'll get into it at a later point, but because of some of my own experiences, he felt that I could be able to give to others. And it was very, very clear to him that I should do this. And I did, you know, and by the time I was 23, I was already practicing as a therapist which is young. And I've been practicing for about 16 years now. So um, yeah, it sent me on a whole path and been able to impact uh, hundreds of people and now wrote a book. And I really credit to that, uh, that advice at that point in my life. That's really cool. So you had the wisdom at the time or the, the wherewithal enough to recognize that somebody saw that in you and you trusted it. That's, 
that gives you a, a nice step ahead, especially if it's in a leg up where you need to go. Yes. Yes, it did. And I did get some pushback from other people, but I felt this person did know me, did understand me, had that insight, and, and I trusted it. And so I was it all the way. Was it like somebody that you really trusted that had just like a, that it coming from that person, like you trusted it more than others? Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Absolutely. Without a doubt. And being, you said 23, I mean, having that clarity that young of an age is kind of a blessing too. Not many people can say that. And <laughs> having that confidence boost, you know, to, to pursue that from, from your friend is, you know, not really, many people can say that too, but that's important is having that, that one person that you can kind of rely on to give you, you know, the, the uh, push out the door, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And I, even in retrospect, as I, now I'm in my career and perhaps, you know, closer to midlife, there's so much experience and knowledge that I've gained over the years being that I started so young, which I feel gives me an advantage to be able to have so much more to give and to help. So uh, having that guidance and that person and that being able to do that at a young age, and uh, as you mentioned, the trust uh, was uh, valuable. What was the most important lesson you learned from your parents? I would say there are many lessons, but honesty and integrity. I didn't really realize that as a young child, but as I grew up and I started to get out in the world, I started to realize that I grew up in an environment that truly valued and modeled honesty. Um, it, it sounds maybe simplistic, oh, be honest, and maybe other people say that, but it's like in my bones. I started to realize as, as I would get out in the world, I would see certain behaviors or actions, and I, it baffled me that, that people, and sometimes my friends would joke, like, I'm too straight. Um, and probably I was a little bit over, you know, overdeveloped on honesty and straight. And I, I, uh, I think I, I, over the years, I balanced out a bit. Um, but, you know, it's just when I see something that's not straight, that's not correct, that's not honest. And it's the little things, things that people would never know. Going back into a store and, you know, realizing they made an error or things that would say, oh, that's so kind of you. To me, that's like just something you do. There's, there's no question about it. You don't take someone else's money. Uh, just to give an example, this just happened in my practice uh, uh, very recently this week. And there was someone who uh, we, take, we, we take private pay, but someone wanted to submit out of network to their insurance company for a psychotherapy services. And uh, they wanted us to sign off a document negotiating with their company or their insurance and that we would uh, decrease the, the fee. When whatever our fee is, we charge what our fee. We don't necessarily have a sliding scale related to this uh, specific service that they wanted. And, um, and they said to me something like, I said to my office manager, oh, it's okay, you'll just make it a supplemental charge or something like that. You know, just tell the insurance company and don't worry about the rest. And we're like, no, <laughs> like that's, that's not something, it wasn't even like question. It was so clear. And they even got angry. Like, well, we're going to pull it. We're going to pull it. It was her daughter. We're going to pull her out. You know? So uh, I'm going to take my child out. And it's like, okay. You know, that's, if that's, uh, if that's what you need to do, that's okay. So it's, it's not, it, it's not a question. And, and I think, you know, I even think my dad, my dad's uh, an accountant. Um, and you know, you can imagine the, the, where there's so many areas in accounting where you can, you know, just not report or turn away or turn a blind eye. And, um, but my dad was just always straight. And it's not like he talked to us about being honest. It was just the way we lived. Um, and then again, I appreciate it more as I got older and I realized that I had that value and it was so strong. But I didn't take credit for it. Like I realized there was so much of what my parents gave over to me. No, I love that. I love that. That's uh, it, it's a good building block, and it's really hard to argue with somebody who's offering those things to you, because really the only way to mutually acquiesce is to do the same, and then it's the most beautiful thing where everybody wins. Yes, and I think it builds respect, mutual mm -hmm. respect. On people and people and trust, which is so essential in, in relationships as well. It's, it's just another way to make someone's day too. Because for example, like I spent, because like, you mentioned if, if uh, you know, somebody gave you too much change at a store, you would go back in 
Mm-hmm. And they mentioned that, well, I spent a considerable number of years as a teller at a bank. And let me tell you, there's been some times when I've given out too much money and my drawer was short at the end of the night or, you know, found a mistake and somebody came back and said, Hey, you know, this is what happened. This is my account was messed up and you gave me too much or whatnot. So, you know, an example like that is just, you know, having an impact in a positive way in, in someone's everyday life. So that's, that's also, you know, a positive aspect of so true. Yeah. 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 You think you won, but somebody could have really, really lost through, just a slip of the mind or, you know, something terrible going on in their life, occupying it. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. That actually reminds me of a story I heard of a banker who actually gave a a tremendous amount of money. I don't remember the details of the story to someone. And uh, once the person realized they went out back to the bank, this was a number of years ago and looking for the teller and the teller was fired. Uh, for that action. Um, and uh, because of that, the person got their job back. So it could go beyond just a smile, you know, it could actually greatly impact someone else's life. Love that story. What book has been most influential on your life and why? So I, I, when I was thinking about this question at our time, uh, figuring out which book, but I guess I'll go on two different paths. Yeah, I was going to say you can you can feel free to uh, to fill in with more if you can't choose. There's no wrong way to answer the question. <laughs> well, overall, you know, I was a student of Jewish Jewish ethics, and I throughout my years and my uh, through uh, studied in somewhat in uh, high school and and as well as in college and and continued onward. And um, there were there was focus, much focus on the Bible and the Talmud and ongoing studying. And, um, and of course, that imparted on me many values uh, and beliefs on how to interact uh, with others um, and how to interact with oneself. Um, and that ongoing study, I, I don't think of anything more when you say the word influential, uh, more than those, those studies and those Points of my life of uh, studying the Bible and studying the Talmud, um, such as learning to love your friend like yourself, uh, you know, certain ideas and concepts, um, and how to follow in this in, in the way of God and and you know and and that that get in His kindness and His compassion and that brings you closer to Him. So I think a lot of those books and studying and still today uh, has been most influential. At the same time, in my and when I think about, again, the word enjoyment or inspiring, but influential, I think about in the field of psychotherapy, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, trained, certified, as well as in other evidence-based psychotherapies. And very early on in my career, I picked up uh, Judith Beck's book on cognitive, th- cognitive therapy, um, cognitive behavior therapy, basics and beyond. And, and it's somewhat of a textbook. but that. When I read that book, it so it had such a profound impact on my ability to see a whole new way of thinking and helping people. And to date, and this is going back many, many years, I go back to that text. I recommend that text as the book that has been most influential in my professional career in life and helping people. Um, so, and I was actually honored to have her write the forward of my recent book so that, that was is phenomenal that, that was huge yeah that was huge and I, I was i there were two things when i uh wrote my book there was the getting the contract with the publisher you know that was the one big excitement and the second thing was when i got that email from her and it was a lot of back and forth till i was able to get through to her um that she not only read the book she loved the book and she wrote a beautiful for it so uh you can imagine the person who's wrote a book that was most influential is now on the cover of your own book. Well, a step into the future, right? Imagine yourself reading that and envision, envisioning that right there. Like, oh yeah, she's going to read your version. Exactly. And do what you're doing right now. That's, that's super cool. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. And it, it also, I think it shows me, and I'm just thinking about this as we speak, that she, she really valued, and, and I actually sent her a copy 
she got she got one from the publisher, but I sent her a copy in Scry. And I, I said in my inscription, you're on every single one of these pages. Uh, you know, there's so much that you've taught me, maybe not specifically, but in the way of thinking and, and understanding and perspective uh, that influence my own writing and helping others. And I, I perhaps I know there's a question later about being a role model and in my professional life, she certainly is. So maybe we'll talk more about that later. Yeah, you're uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, the, the wisdom that we get passed down is from generations of, you know, refining and things that worked and the people that were strong enough to survive to carry that wisdom. So, you know, it's, it's amazing that through all of that alg- amalgamation of time and experience culminate into an individual who gets to propel it through you. And I don't know, I just, I love seeing that progression of thoughts and ideas forward and, you know, new things coming out of, you know, that, I don't know. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. Being passed down from generation to generation. I mean, we, we all are, you know, our, our, our parents and our grandparents and our teachers and they're the ones who, and we don't realize that. And I think as we get older, we start seeing more and more within ourselves that we are them. Uh, although maybe not realizing that when we're young, when we're young, we're thinking, uh, we're ourselves. We know better. <laughs> we figured it out. Yeah, we're all in the absorbing process. We don't really think that during that entire thing that you know we're exuding to the next generation. Yes, you know we're it's 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 that's the one thing I've noticed about getting older is you start to see yourself on that that larger spectrum of the timeline, and you can start seeing where you're going better. And yeah, it's a fun perspective. Mm-hmm. What daily habits or rituals do you have? Meditation and prayer. Mm. So I take time every single day, uh, focusing on my needs, asking God for my needs, meditating, mindfulness, and giving thanks for the many, many blessings that ritual is a regular ritual in my daily life. And I think that's uh, really uh, empowering. I think it helps one emotionally. It helps one deal with struggle um, and uh, to be able to focus, number one, on the the many blessings and wonderful things you have in your life. At the same time, having, believing, if you do, as a religious person, that there is a higher power who that you can talk to and turn to, uh, to give you strength, to give you courage, uh, to give you wisdom, and also to give you those mundane, everyday needs. Uh, that you need for yourself and for your family. Uh, so that is something that I have not missed a day, I would say, <laughs> in my entire life. So I would call that a ritual. So you grew up meditating as a young, age, as a young man too? Um, not as much meditating. Definitely was a, in my home. There was, I, you know, prayer was something that we did regular in school. We did prayer. Um, and then move more to, to you know, in, integrating meditation, mindfulness into prayer as well. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're very closely aligned. So. Yeah. Because when we try to focus our attention, our, our, our minds naturally go all over the place. Um, and it's very hard to, to focus, uh, and to be present. So, uh, integrating that actually enhances the ability to connect, to be grounded and to pray. Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned the, the, the uh, giving thanks aspect because that's something that we're big on this show on is gratitude. We have a jingle that we do in the intros. So I think that's helpful to do that in the beginning of the day because you can kind of carry that mindset with you throughout and mm-hmm. it makes things better. Yeah, I have a, I work with people who struggle with depression and there's lots of research that focuses on the benefits of looking at one's day or life and finding gratitude. There's a specific exercise that I love to give and I've seen it be really impactful is the BAT exercise, which is B stands for blessings, A stands for accomplishments, and T stands for talents or traits. So every day, writing down even a small thing of blessing, Accomplish something that you've accomplished today or accomplished in the past, 
And again, that could be really small. And a talent, a trait, a character, a part of your character. And, and that, again, mindful awareness and bringing attention to those things can actually significantly help one's mood and bringing their attention to the fact that there are, there are so many wonderful things about them. There are so many blessings in their life. There's so much to, so much to have gratitude for. And, um, and they've accomplished, although they often feel hopeless, depressed, failure, defectiveness. And that's what depression does. It gets, at, get, gets us at our core um, and, and the negative thinking and negative core beliefs about ourselves. And taking that time to do a simple exercise like that can have profound impact on one's mood and function. I love that. You change the environment for the person to be in because we're so adaptable. But if you surround yourself with something, you'll adapt into it. And, you know, unless you can see that way out, that's cool. So it's, it's a way to kind of force you to see, see beyond where you are, get little glimpses and like take baby steps because baby steps turn into miles. Yeah. And people who struggle with depression have what we call tunnel vision. They don't really see beyond. They don't see the full picture. And this, an exercise like this can help open their mind. That's awesome. I'm assuming there's some sort of like long-term recording so you can see like progression of scale and. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, I give measures all the time and I, I use lots of strategies and interventions. So it's, um, I can't remember who uh, developed this uh, specific strength-based exercise, but I think he's done research on this specific technique and I've seen the long-term benefits and effects. Very cool. If I were to ask your best friend, what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most and why? So believe it or not, you sent me these questions before I actually asked my best friend because <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> what would he say? <laughs> you know, so um, he said that I'm too hard on myself. I expect, no, I don't know if those words, he said, I expect too much of myself at times. Um, or he said, I expect too much of myself. And I said, at times, he says, yes, at times, because <laughs> I don't think it's always, but I do think so. And I think in a way that has helped me succeed in many areas in life. Uh, and I, I work with people who struggle with this, but if it's overdeveloped, that's where it can become problematic or you're overcompensating. So I, I do think sometimes I expect too much of myself and push myself a bit too much. Um, but I've, I've learned over the years to know my limits, accept my limits. And, uh, and that just takes, you have to learn to be again, or keep bringing up awareness and mindfulness, be aware of yourself, to be aware of your environment, uh, to real, be aware of your own emotions and to know when's the time to take a step back, step forward, to notice when you're being critical or judgmental of yourself and realizing the unhelpful, the unhealthiness and how they're unhelpful. In, in moving you forward. So, um, and I, I think that's something that's been passed down from my family too, <laughs> you know, in, in, a, in a good way. And again, at the same time, it, it could be uh, debilitating when you uh, expect. So that's, that's mm -hmm. been ongoing work, I guess, for me. Yeah, I can imagine. But at least it's in a, a giving and helping field. So it's probably a little easier to keep yourself uh, less ego maniacal. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, mm -hmm. keeping yourself a little more grounded. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a good thing to uh, to want <laughs> to try too hard to do. Yeah. Yes. Do, do you think that people with uh, perfectionism kind of have that trait as, as in expecting too, too much out of themselves at times? And is it hard for them to I don't know. Be kind to themselves. Like, is that does that make any sense? Are there any tips or tricks for that? Like, kind of like the bat thing that you're talking. About? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, people with perfectionism, it's exactly, and they have very rigid, inflexible thinking patterns uh, that that get in the way, where they are highly self-critical. Um, often, they internalize. Not always, they internalize the critical parent voice in their mind. Uh, and that's actually, there's a disorder for that when it's, when it's really apparent. And again, I always tell my you know, clients, perfectionism is a wonderful quality. 
The only problem with it is you can't always be perfect. That's where it gets in the way. You are going to fall. And that's where they suffer because it's very black and white. Either I'm perfect or I'm a failure. I love perfectionists when I do therapy because they do their homework. They, come <laughs> <on time. laughs> you know, they do everything they got to do. Uh, at the same time, I don't want them to always do everything because I told them to do it. I want them to do it on their yeah, own. It's, it's still a rut. I'm sorry? Oh, I just said it's still a rut. Yes. Yeah. So the goal is imperfect success, not perfect success. And, and that's very much what I try to help people and, and become aware of the, those critical thoughts and learn to modify, restructure, reframe those patterns of thinking. Sometimes I'll say to say, let's do an experiment. One day on, one day off. I want one day you just follow that. I need to work hard. I need to produce. I can't, I can't stop. It's not okay. And the other day, just, just as an experiment, take it easier. Let things slide. Let things go. Don't do this. You know, see which day works out better and see actually often, see which day is more productive. You know, and that's something you can certainly see over time. Perhaps in the short term, there's a reason why you're doing because you're reinforced because look what I accomplished today. Over the long term, though, it's not uh, effective over the long term. And even if you get the job done, are you happy? Are you calm? Are you at peace? How are your relationships? Questions you can ask yourself. Crazy. Yeah, it doesn't seem yeah. like a very sustainable mindset when you no. when you stretch it out. Yeah. Get distracted no, by the efficiency. What are you most curious about? People fascinate me. I guess that makes sense because I'm a therapist. <laughs> but they do. It's funny when I go out with my wife to a restaurant, she she always makes me sit not looking at the door. Like I have to sit facing her, you know, or find like a wall in the back because I like, you know, I, I people watch. Um, I love to observe people. Can you imagine if you're in an airport and you got off your, I was very disturbed actually a number of years ago when I went to the, to the airport and then suddenly like every table has technology on it. It used to be like it could be in your pocket. Like you can't, you can't get, you can't go to a, you can't sit at a table without you know, a big screen in front of you that's blocking you and the other person. But imagine if you remove that and you just sat back and just observed and see different personalities and culture, cultures, behaviors, emotional responses and reactions and wondering where they come from and their environment. So I'm always curious about people. I always want to learn about people. I want to understand the depth of people. And, and the causes of what leads to people doing what they do. Very cool. And you can learn so much just from watching people. You, I mean, it is amazing. I used to do loss prevention, so I spent more hours than I can tell watching people. But, you know, when you start picking up mannerisms and body language and really paying attention to people, you you can learn so much more about a person than, than they even understand that they're telling you. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, and that's really, there's so much that's in the verbal, nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. about, you know, I do consultations. I meet people just once to give them some feedback, recommendations, brief assessment of whatever the presenting issue is. And there's so much that, I learn about from the way they walk in the door, the way they respond to me to certain question, you know, questions mm -hmm. and not what they say. It's not the content, just in that, like you said, that mannerisms and gestures. And what's fascinating about that also is, is that people actually, and there's research on this, people believe people's mannerisms and gestures faster than their words. So if I look at you and I say, I'm not angry at you. Mm -hmm. Or I, and I have an angry face on. You're not. You're not going to really believe me. Um, so there's so much that we're giving off that we don't realize how it affects other people and how it affects us and our environment. Um, and observe that. And I, I'm interested in parenting too. So I always get you know watching parents and children and how they interact. Um, I always 
find that interesting. And I obviously I wrote the book because I felt there was much I can offer in that area. No, I love that. And it's fascinating. I've never made the connection before, but I used to do like retail interrogations for internal cases. And I'm just thinking about how in parallel that can be to therapy because you're really gaining all this information. I'm looking at where your eyes are going to tell if you're creating or recalling something, a memory or a thought and putting this in. But if I have that as an honest, so I can see if you're being even honest with yourself, that's a powerful tool from a therapist to, you know, just have an honest conversation, you know, especially as somebody in therapy, at least, you know, as I would see it, you know, part of, you know, problems can be not being honest with yourself. So yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's a really, really cool, really cool thing. It's, it's, it's awesome that you focus on that. Yeah. What, one of the things we do in cognitive therapy is as soon as I see a change and observe a change, I ask them, what's going through your mind right now? Interesting. And I get a lot of data because yeah. I know something's changed, but they're not going to necessarily tell me. And often they won't tell me. When you have direct questions, mm -hmm. more likely people will answer. People yeah. say to me, how in 45 minutes do you get so much information? It's all about the 13 questions, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Because you you're bringing a person to a point and asking them the right question right at the emotional time when they're ready to release it. And you can trigger and go on that. And that's, yeah, that's super, super powerful because that's how you get it. You, you get that, that release. That's, well, at least for this, I'm, I'm, that was just a really cool connection to make in my mind. I never really thought that there was like a therapeutic interrogation connection before, but that's kind of cool. What is the most embarrassing or humbling experience of your life? I'm really not sure. That's the truth. I definitely got embarrassed. <laughs> I definitely felt humbled. I don't know what the most embarrassing was. I guess I was, when I saw this question, I was thinking to myself that uh, by the fact that I don't really recall that most embarrassing, uh, I guess that tells me I was able to move on from most of them. Uh, and grow from most of those experiences. We I mean, have some childhood memories, perhaps a little bit, where you know, I got up in public and then I didn't sound clear or something like, thing or something like that, but nothing, nothing that really stands out. Uh, I definitely messed up. I've definitely had embarrassing moments uh, and on a regular basis. Um, but I can't really think about the most embarrassing or humbling. Uh, specific experience. But that's also great. That means that you're not dwelling on it and you've learned to move past, which, I mean, again, stumbling block that you've got over. So that's, that's a great answer. Thank you. What is your greatest fear? How did you overcome it if you have? So believe it or not, public speaking. And I lecture <laughs> I was going to say, I was looking at your site, classrooms, yes. teachers. Yes. I'm like, and people who know me from way back then are like, they can't believe it. They can't believe it. I was, I was a, probably starting as an adolescent. And I loved speaking. I loved speaking in public. I loved inspiring, impacting other people. Um, but, and I, I knew I had the capability. I had a certain clarity. And I really wanted to be able to give over. Uh, I found just getting up in front of a crowd. So how did I get over that? Um, it's interesting when I was, uh, I remember it, I went to my mom, I said, I get anxious uh, myself. I, they, I get anxious around, you know, so I want to be able to, I could see in the future of my career, and I want to be able to speak in public. I want to be able to inspire others. I want to get over this. So she took me to a therapist. <laughs> uh, that's before I knew I wanted to be a therapist. I knew I was young, but I wasn't that young. And um, she took me to this therapist, and he was a psychoanalytical psychodynamic therapist. And I was like six, seven sessions in, and every session I'm like, okay, so what do I do to get over this? And he's just exploring and talking, and then I had an interest in music, classical music. Came to a point, it was like an older gentleman. Yeah. And then I think it was the last session, he said to me something like, well, you know, you should be a therapist too. And then I said, I came out of there. I said, mom, I'm done. 
<laughs> this is not working. <laughs> I've been here a number of sessions and I'm still so socially anxious. I don't know what I'm doing here. And now he's telling me I should be a therapist. When am I becoming his therapist? I don't know. It just didn't feel right to me. So um, then I went to uh, someone else who I knew of and they said, hey, you could take medication, you know, before you get up. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I said, or you could read a book. So he gave me a book. Book wasn't really helpful, let's be honest. So um, now I could tell you what I did from a psychological standpoint, but then I didn't. I, I basically did exposure therapy. Awesome. Uh, I said to myself, this is what I want. These are my values. These are my goals. I'm going along for the run and I'm going to keep throwing myself in there. And I'm going to do it again and again and again. Uh, so I did. And I threw myself in situations. And even if I got anxious, and I remember the first, one of the first talks I gave, you know, I was like preparing and I was anxious. And I, uh, I remember like really took me over. Um, but there have been many, many talks since then. <laughs> And uh, now I just have healthy anxiety before, as I teach my clients. We want to have some anxiety, right? You, you don't want to get up there and be, uh, you know, completely loose, not prepare. So um, exactly. All the greats are terrified before they're doing big things. Fighters are like, you know, having panic attacks. They go out there. You never exactly. see that. You think they're the, you know, biggest, baddest guy on the planet, but he was near breakdown. So yeah, it's it's good. You need it. It's it's fuel. Yeah. If you're not scared cool. of it, well, it can't be that important. Or can't be like you. Yeah. You got to succeed. Yeah, we call that. I don't know why it's called this, but it's called the upside down U. Hmm. If you can imagine upside down U is as you're going up. They could uh, maybe you guys could think of a better name because I think there should be a better name. But as you go up the U, the Mario Hill. Yes, there you go. That's better. So as you're going up. It's actually helping your performance, the anxiety, mm -hmm. but then it peaks out and then it starts hurting your performance if it's too much. So there's no question about it. It fuels you, gives you adrenaline that uh, helps you prepare, be alert. Amazing things happen to our body when we're anxious. Uh, you know, our eyes dilate, our lungs dilate. I mean, we're, we're, we're more, in a way, we can dissociate, of course, from high levels of anxiety. Um, so... Yeah, I think most people hearing this, if they're listening, who know me would be quite shocked to hear this. But yes, that was my bi my biggest fear uh, of messing up or of shaking or of, and um, yeah, I, I would say I'm I'm pretty much over it. Phenomenal, love it. What quality do you most admire in a man, and why? A growth mindset, thirst for knowledge always to be a growing individual because drive uh, when a person has drive towards growth leads to success leads to achievements. Um, we all have, we don't even know our potential. We don't even know how much we can do with our brains and there's science on this as well. And uh, if you believe and you keep pushing, uh, you'd be surprised what you can accomplish. And I think, I admire that in people where I see people have that mindset of constant growth. Again, we talked about that with balance, not perfectionism, but constant, you know, a mindset of growth, a desire for knowledge, for understanding. And uh, I, I, I respect and admire people. And, and I can see, I, I see over time, I have close friends who share those values and I, I see their growth. I see who they become. Uh, often they don't see who they become. And I get to, to watch it. And I think that's it's very admirable, uh, especially in our generation where I think very often people are, are not as focused on growth, um, more focused on in the moment, uh, focus on the here and now, focus on the quick fix. So uh, I, that's something I value. And perhaps a lot of my, uh, I guess, as I talked about, my Jewish ethics, moral, ethics, you know, that learning Bible Talmud probably impacted me in that, in that respect too, I would imagine. Because there's always something more to uncover, especially like no matter what angle you're taking the Bible from, like there's always, it's always something to glean from that. So like, yeah, be having that hunger for knowledge and just, I don't know, for me, it's like not, I hate being bored. So like, if I'm going to sit around, like I might as well be learning something. Right. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, that's great. And that's that's such a healthy, admirable attitude. But I think some people think if I'm bored, let me play a game on my phone or let me just just go through social media and see, you know, what's going on in the world rather than having that thirst to learn to knowledge. Because you're right, it's, it's, it's never ending. I mean, we only have a certain amount of time that we're alive. And, uh, you know, there's just so much to learn. And actually, that's a good part of the web. <laughs> it's like today's day and age, you can, you can learn so much about so many things, uh, even as a, as a professional. You know, it's like you can, it's on the tip of your fingers. Um, and I think if you have that growth mindset, mm -hmm. you can also be able to help other people learn so much information to be able to help other people. So, yeah, because uh, our thoughts and our ideas are only, you know, it's like your book. It's only from what we've been able to absorb and put together from other people and, you know, other systems that have worked and done good. So, yeah, I mean, there is something to be said, you know, to people who don't exercise that as they get in age, you just, I don't want to say undeveloped, but it's just, there's a person that just doesn't have the richness or the, the knowledge and wisdom that you would think. And everybody has it from a different angle and a different perspective on your interests. And I mean, it's incredibly valuable to, I don't know, it, to me, it, it's, uh, what is it? The, the guy who wrote the, the book of the seven rings, it's kind of, you know, the more you learn about one thing, you're going to learn the processes and the things that work. And when you go to do something else, whether it's martial arts or whether it's painting a painting, the one is going to help the other and the other is going to help. So no matter where you develop your knowledge, you're going to find growth in different areas. So yeah, I love when people do that because it, you know, it, you can become more well-rounded by focusing in one spot. Yeah. And I want to add to that. And I think we mentioned this somewhat before, and this is a, a saying, you know, is that you can learn from all people. You can learn from any people, any person. And going back to the idea of observing, you, there are so many opportunities when you interact with people mm -hmm. to, to ask, to understand, and to learn from them, from their ideas, from their perspectives. And uh, one of the things that I talk about in, in my book is the concept of dialectics. Um, and I don't know if you or your audience are familiar with that concept, but it's the idea that there can be two ideas that uh, are opposites, opposing mm -hmm. ideas or that seem contradictory or are. And there can be truth in both perspectives. And the ability to stop and find the kernel of truth in the other person's perspective. There's so much you can learn if you have that willingness, that openness, that fl flexibility. It can get you unstuck. And certainly in parenting, that's really essential as well. Um, but yeah. There, there is so much that we can learn from other people. And it's not just about our own ideas and our, you know, our belief systems or our ways of growing up. Or there, There's just a whole world out there. And if you have that thirst and you just want that growth, it's all around you. No, I, I absolutely love that. When, when I was younger, I never understood like, Republican, Democrat, you know, liberal, conservative. And as I've gotten older, it's like there are these divides in people's lines where it's that they're they're not willing to come to the table and go, okay, well, here's your ideas. Here's my ideas. Battle them out and let's find an in-between or a best because ultimately you're going to have something that works good and I'm going to have something that works good. And if you can have the perspective to to breach that, that's that seems like it would be just a um, a technique that would be beneficial just for, for the populace in mass. Yeah. I'll take it a step further. Let's say you go to the table and you can't find a middle ground. You could still get to the table and acknowledge there's another perspective. Yeah. There might be a truth there that you might not understand. Mm -hmm. Just make room for it. And perhaps through time, over time, truth evolves. Over time, we get more clarity. But the ability to respect and understand that there could be two ideas that can sit down at the table at the same time without the resentment and anger and understanding that we can agree to disagree. We can agree to not understand. That doesn't mean we have to approve. It means we just acknowledge 
that there's another perspective, another side. I think that in itself would come a long way. I love it. I love it. Just got to get people to kick themselves in the pants and get them over that line. Yeah, <laughs> which is a hard line to get them over. A very hard line. Yeah, you know, we had a previous guest in, and she had a very interesting perspective. She was basically said, look, you know, we live in between us, you know, you have your ideas and what thoughts and words mean. And, you know, these associations, I have my ideas and then we speak to other and we have an agreement about, you know, what we think these words and these thoughts mean. And that lives between us, you know, our view of this. And, and we think the other person sees it as we do, but really, no, they have different understandings and perspectives of words and dictionaries in their head. And so all these things. And so it's beautiful just to think that, yeah, listen, there is something in between us and, and it's living right there and it's okay for it to be separate and it's okay not to understand it because, you know, if you don't have all the data sets, maybe you can't, you know, and the only way you're going to get it is by broaching the other person and, you know, not being fearful of, like you said, you know, the, the other idea, you know, having two conflicting thoughts in your head. Yeah. And that's where communication comes in. And that's what I do actually as a therapist, I address people's, even whether it's a, a, a couple um, they have certain uh, ideas um, and uh, based on the way the other person communicated, they immediately come to conclusions and that's just how they see it to be. Mm-hmm. And they never get past that because that's what it is. When you actually sit down and you start to talk and you say, well, this is what I'm, fe-, and the other person looks at that's not what I mean. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but if we never talk about it, we never know. And our emotions and our behaviors are all driven by those belief systems and those ideas that we've established in our minds. Yeah, we, think, the, we think everybody else is living inside of our head. But when you think that you know, people don't really care as much about you as you think they do, they're worried about the same things you are. <laughs> yeah, people mind read all the time. And they seem to know what everyone else is thinking about them and about others. Um, and even when we correct them, often, mm-hmm. no, nah, you're just saying that. Or, you don't really believe that. Or I, I don't know. I, it, it feels too true to me, what my perspective. So I can't let go of that. You can get a person really stuck. No, that's cool. You have an awesome job. You have, I, and I mean that like it's a hard one. <laughs> it is, but you're you're basically tr- you're training or getting a person to think in a different way, to change the patterns of their thoughts, to break a cycle, and to go down new avenues. And that is really fascinating to do because it's like you said. Ultimately, you're just communicating, and you're getting the other person to do all of the work. You know, it's kind of like to be the Olympian, you know, you need a coach that's going to show you the proper technique and how to get there. And, you know, ultimately you still did it. You know, Usain, you know, is the fastest runner because he is, uh, but he couldn't have got there without a good team either. Yeah. I mean, that's what I tell people. I say, my goal is to make you into a therapist. That's awesome. Strategies. You're going to do this yourself. That's my goal. And uh, we, a lot of, even it's, strategies and techniques as as far as the therapy we use a lot of socratic questioning we use a lot of guided discovery to help them discover the conclusions not to tell them what their conclusions are or conceptualize for them oh this is because you grew up in this environment that's why you're having the struggle as opposed to collaborating you know in a collaborative approach saying you know does this make sense what do you think could it be something else so that they learn and they grow and they come to the conclusions and give them the skills and strategies to be able to use on them, use themselves. So ultimately, yeah, they're doing the work and people come to me years later and, you know, uh, whether they, they're settling down and they found the one and they're coming to thank me for everything. I said, you know, this is, this is you. Well, this is what's beautiful about you tying it to parenting too, is because you're starting at the base level. If we can get people understanding this themselves and you're teaching your children, I mean, this is, this is, you know, that six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, exponential growth, you know, um, you, that's really, really how you could start making deep impact with this. And I don't know that that's a really beautiful thing just, and it makes sense just to take it down to the fundamental parenting level. You got it. 
you're right on because those formative years when you're developing, those are the most crucial years. That's when your brain is developing, when you're most vulnerable and so much that goes on in that parent-child interaction is what affects a, 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 an individual for many, many years. And if I, parents could learn those techniques and strategies and skills and help their children and understand and accept their children who they are and help them move towards change in a healthy way and address the parent's own emotions, um, that could lead to more success because so many of those who are so stuck in their ways are because of a lot of childhood trauma in their you know, dysfunctional or problematic home environments. You have what, six children? I do. No, no, because <laughs> this I, is when I go into podcasts, you know, I tell people about my old degrees, they're not really interested in that. But when I tell my six children, well, from this perspective, I mean, talk about a degree, just I'm thinking about the amount of years, how many, you know, let's say they're all six years old. Well, we've got six times six, like that is a lot of cumulative experience with human beings and not saying being able to test, but seeing the input output over time and seeing that input output as children are next to each other. And one's coming along that, I mean, just from an experiential standpoint is something that, I mean, you're never going to be able to do unless you're in that environment and, you know, teachers and caregivers to a degree, but the 24 hour a day plus the genetics, that's, that's really beautiful, man. And it's just cool that you're in that position with what you're doing. So yeah, I mean the degrees, but that's a degree in parenting and having the skills to test and improve. That's, that's super cool. Not, not to pat you on the back too much. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And I have a 18, 19 month old, and I have a 16 year old. So you can imagine, I don't have six, six year olds, because I don't know if I can handle Oh that. my gosh, that would be. <laughs> As my wife says, <laughs> you know, we never had twins, because God knows what she can handle. So she couldn't handle that. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's beautiful, and it's wonderful, and it's a gift, it's tough, and it's amazing to see the different personalities, temperaments, emotional makeup, behavior, and the input and output like you talk about. Each, each child has different needs uh, and, and constantly trying to, again, be mindful and observe and trying to meet those needs in the best possible way and mess up. And mess up, which is okay. That is okay because, you know, uh, a topic that comes up very often is even if you had terrible parents, you learn from their mistakes and you know, so, you know, even in those mistakes, as long as, you know, your children aren't hidden from them and have some sort of visibility so that they hopefully will not make it. I mean, it's like you said, nobody's perfect. You're, you're going to fall even in terrible ways, but, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who were, or are your role models and why? So I know I mentioned a lot about um, my studies through adolescence and some high school, college, I did have one um, uh, religious teacher that I've actually been in touch with since I was a teenager uh, and a, a true role model uh, for his wisdom, selflessness, uh, always putting others before himself. And I think most importantly, humility. It's just something I, despite his vast, knowledge and um, giving to so many and teaching so many. Um, but it's always, even to myself, he considers me often will refer to me as a friend, which I am totally uncomfortable <laughs> when he says that. But, you know, and just to give an example, I mean, I, I, I've given presentations and, uh, you know, on, on different areas of psychotherapy and He's come and spent the day just listening to me. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he's, he has his own families, students, children, grandchildren. Um, but he really, uh, he's always been there for me. And he's a role model uh, and someone I can always turn towards. I would say in my professional life, a role model, which I mentioned earlier, was Judy Beck. Um, and when I actually studied in Beck Institute, and I got to see her. 
she embodies what I wanted to be as a therapist. She was, she's a master therapist delivering evidence-based technique in a structured, organized, focused manner, yet so genuine and real and compassionate and empathetic. And I think sometimes, you know, people think about CBT or DBT or other evidence-based practices that might know they're like, oh, that's a very mechanical treatment. And it's not really understanding the person or connecting to the person. Uh, and I think that's a myth uh, for those who really studied it. But Judy Beck, and I've seen her role play, and, and she's just always been that role model. model me. I want to be that master therapist. I want to be able to embody what she does. Uh, and I've always looked up to her. So again, that goes back to her being on the forward of my book is so much more meaningful. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? I know what I would love to see. I just can't imagine how it could change or I can have a chance to change it. I think it's so much of what we focused on so far is I, th I think if people in society would be more focused on awareness and self-inspection and slowing down um, and being more in tune with themselves and looking at their own um, drives and actions. Um, I think that would be really helpful for society at large. I think, I don't know if it's specifically the times, I don't know if it's technology, but I think this is an art that we're losing. I, I, that I think mo modern society, perhaps as a whole, and it's not an absolute, I wouldn't say it seems like that is not what this podcast is about, clearly. Uh, but I do think that is something that I would love to help somehow, um, maybe through the school systems, while people are young, to, to get them to a place to question, <laughs> question, and, and to have more awareness, and, and to be able to look deep down in themselves, within themselves. And see where they can improve or what they can do different uh, as a person. And rather than everyone just following their urges, following you know the next new game, uh, the next you know, which is all part of life. Fun is good. Pleasure is good. Um, money is good. We need those drives. They're important. But I think we're. I think we're. It feels to me that modern society is not as balanced as it could be. Yeah, people kind of become the products and the things in the image and the brand name and the, the Instagram image instead of, you know, sitting back and not letting those things own them and just figuring out, because it's like you said before, you know, about not, are you, are you happy? You know, are you not anxious? You know, what are you experiencing right now? Because, you know, you're living through these other things. Well, is that the life you want? And then figure out what you do want. Cause if that brings you happiness, then you can kind of remove yourself from that societal mind cage that, you know, has locked you into a certain behavior or thought structure. And it doesn't have to have the negative thoughts. You just have to figure out a way to rearrange your thoughts or redirect the energy to a, a positive way of thinking. And if you can see that, like, it's like you said, the other side, if you can break you, break yourself from that, see that other side, see a different perspective that gives you a better view and a better feeling without being negatively impacted on your worldview, then go for it. At least that's how I try to view the world. You know, otherwise it would be the most depressing place ever. <laughs> yeah. Instead, I try to view it like a movie. I could never make up the script. You know, there's sometimes I just sit back and enjoy the popcorn and watch the train wreck because if I can't affect it, learn from it. Yeah. And that's acceptance of what is and trying to learn from what is, which is something else I also try to teach a lot about acceptance, the things that we can change uh, and learn for ourselves and for those that we are connected to uh, in our environment. And we can pass down those things that are important to us, to those who are closest to us. What is the most courageous thing you have ever done in your life or have ever seen? 
I guess you would call this courageous. I did battle childhood cancer uh, at 17. I had um, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So in 11th grade, my world sort of crashed down on me and my focus changed. So uh, I'm well for many years, um, but it was definitely a time that was quite scary and needed courage. And I think the people in my environment helped encourage me and empower me to, to do what I needed to do to get myself better. That was my focus and that was my, my goal. Uh, I've certainly learned and grown from that experience, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I don't know if I would call it courageous. I think I just did what I needed to do, but I didn't let it take me over. So I guess that's a courage. But that's huge. I mean, I have a family member who was like a great grandfather who for like decades had decided the day he was going to die and he missed it by with like a week. And it's like, <sighs> so, but the, if you put it in your mind, placebo effect is real. Well, what's the opposite of that? So yeah, like to your credit, yeah. Keeping that positive mindset, you know, can have way more of an effect than people could understand on your physiologically and pulling you through. And that's why it's so empowering, whether it's mental health or physical health. I mean, they're all intertwined anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. And I was given that advice at the time. I was saying, don't focus so much on the medical, just focus on, you know, being happy and uh, focusing on positivity. Um, and I think it actually led me into a world uh, of really, because I, I, I went to a summer camp of other children struggling with illness. And I had like friends. I was at a lot of funerals for young people over the next few years um, when I was involved. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that also, that was to courage to be able to, you know, one of my closest friends at the time passed and uh, I just learned so much from him um, and his courage. See, I think we're going full circle here. Yeah. No, it's, it's the most beautiful thing about life on all levels. That even in moments like that, that, I mean, you're passing on something that clearly today is impactful, meaningful, and you get to pull forward. It's, I don't know, it's, it's one of the cooler things about life. Absolutely. Absolutely. What does it mean to be a man in today's world? To some, this may seem old school, but I believe ultimately taking responsibility for one's family emotionally and financially. That's what it means to me uh, in terms of, you know, I guess that's probably the most important thing to me right now is my family and as my role as a dad, as a man towards my family, I, I ultimately hold that responsibility. Uh, to ensure that their needs are met physically and emotionally to the best of my ability. It seem that may seem old school, but wouldn't you agree that there's does that does seem like what is under attack? Like if you're in our current culture is the family unit. So like, I mean, I think that's a great answer. So no, I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. It's like when you see questions like this today, I, I immediately, I, I would see a question like this today differently than maybe I would have seen it five years ago and 10 years ago. Uh, you know, I even noticed some emotion when I saw the question, how are people going to respond? What does exactly. that mean people? And it's, it's a question that is divided on so many lines and perspectives. Yeah. And even the question is kind of what does it mean to be a man or what does it mean to be a man? So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's very, and it's important. Because as much as people want to say that there's no differences between genders, there are some very base things that, I mean, I at least know in scouting and you talked about honesty and integrity and there was these other very base things and, and very, you know, I don't want to say manly, but just more men orientated learning things that, that really helped you in relationship and going further and it's nice to see people focus on that. And, you know, it's to say like, it's great that you have a father figure there. It, it, 
it really means something. It's it's kind of like that part of that wisdom. There is kind of a genetic wisdom in the same way that, you know, you can, you know, a, a mother kitten is going to rear her cat. A mother is going to do the same thing. A father is going to do the same thing. And um, yeah, I, I love it when people accept that today. Oh, thank you. And, and I, I, there, I don't even see it. I see it in my relationship with my wife is awesome as a partnership. There's so many it's beautiful she provides and does that I can't do. Mm-hmm. It's not about, you know, it's just different roles and what it means for each of us. Um, but it's not one higher than the other. It's we're just, there's our dialectic again. It's just the two differences. And, and the world is built on opposites. That's what dialectics teaches us. I mean, everything. There's matter and there's antimatter. There's positive and negative charges. There's man and woman. Mm-hmm. And all those opposites are there to be synthesized, to come together in order to live um, and be there. So I appreciate you appreciating that. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah. Um, and I, I saw the question both ways. So I, I decided to answer it the way I did. Well, uh, that, oh, sorry, that time I did cut you off there, Bill. No, no I was just going to say, it's an, yeah, it's an awesome answer. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, that, uh, that Mattis, was the 13 questions. I, I got to say, I, uh, I'm, I'm way more excited about this interview than I anticipated. I mean, I saw your credentials and anything, but this has just been really awesome, giving me some great new perspectives and... Yeah, I just I, I I really do love what you're doing and how you're trying to to help people. It seems like yeah, get people out of, you know, negative cycles and behaviors and really into focusing on, you know, important things. At least, you know, what is important to you? Family? All right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mattis. Um, just a question for you. How was it answering the questions? I'm interested because when I answered them, even though I'd been doing the show for a while, it took me way longer than I thought when I sat down. I had to do a lot of internalizing. And I'm just, I'm always kind of interested in just a person's perspective when they, they sat down with them. Yeah, when I sat down with them and I, I first opened up the email with the questions, I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, okay, I just did about 15 podcasts in the last four or five weeks. This is a whole different book here. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed some anxiety. I noticed some confusion. I'm like, okay, did I did I sign up for this? <laughs> um, with all that being said, um, I actually enjoyed it. I actually I, I felt even as we're going through this, I felt a certain depth or experienced, I should say, a certain depth that I, I usually don't necessarily experience on in conversations. Uh, so I, I, I really, I really appreciate it. Um, some of the questions I really had to think about, um, I thank you so much for sending them before, cause I could not imagine <laughs> what it would have been like on the spot, even though I actually, one of my strengths is, and when I'm in audiences or parenting, like you shoot that question out of me, I'll take anything, but these type of questions, <laughs> the type of questions that, you know, um, but I, I try to be as open, as honest as, as I can. Uh, as I, as I, you know, I I try to take it, take it very seriously. And, uh, so yeah, there were a lot of mixed emotions. Um, and, uh, it was, I, I wouldn't say for me personally, like these questions were foreign. These Mm -hmm. ideas were new for some of your, uh, guests. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not making that assumption. I'm thinking perhaps, uh, for me, these are. I, I think about life all the time. Well, Mattis, and, and I mean this, um, if you have any questions you feel would fit into this, feel free to send them over. It's not a set in list. It's a growing list, a cycling list. So yeah, I'm, I'm thoroughly interested. This list, I don't know if you know, Darren, who runs Grimerica show, he asked a ton of people that he really respected and he valued their perspective. So this comes from his years of podcasting and people he's connected with and personal friends. And he asked them to create a list for a show like this. And this is how it came up. He took what he thought were the most apropos questions. And so, yeah, um, 
If you're already thinking about that stuff, feel free to just funnel that information our way. We're not going to complain. Okay. Got it. I'm, I'm glad to hear that as you got further into the podcast and we started, you became more comfortable with it because you said it was kind of, you know, something that's not really uh, used comparable to the other podcasts that you were on. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that we were able to create a space that you're comfortable being honest and, and having the, you know, the conversations like this and just to kind of tie it back into uh, your answer to question 11 about how people should be focusing more on introspection and awareness. That's kind of, you know, the driving force behind this podcast. And to me, that speaks about, you know, in, intentionality, li living with intention and being the best versions of ourselves. So yeah, thank you for taking the time to be with us and to help us, uh, you know, spread that, further that message and that, you know, spread the project. Yeah, you know, I know. I noticed that. And you know, even when I said that, I, I see that's, that's clear from the, your presentation. And I think it's also, you did make, you do make your guests feel really comfortable and you, you give them, um, you give them the space uh, and, and encouragement uh, and, and valid, you know, reinforcement to continue expressing and sharing whatever their thoughts might be. So thank you for that. Good to hear. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> Mattis, if anybody wants to know about you, learn more, um, purchase your book, hopefully raise some beautiful, wonderful children that can perpetuate this uh, more rational way of thinking or yeah. being honest with themselves, where can they find you? So they can go to my website, theuncontrollablechild.com. On my website uh, is listed all your favorite online sellers. And you can just click there and go to wherever you would like. The book is really available everywhere. It's also available in many local bookstores, Barnes and Nobles. Uh, you can see, you can check online to see if it's if you're the type that wants to be able to or go into a bookstore and see the book before you purchase it. Um, and then um, also on, if you take your receipt and you go back to the website, there's a place uh, to put in your receipt number to get bonus material where I actually go through some of the downloadable material and skills and I have videos explaining them. There's also um, on my blog page, I have a series of videos where I do some book readings and some real life examples related to parenting. So there's that information. And you could also there, we have master classes coming on for mental health professionals, for parents, for educators. So you can get all that information there. You can also follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook, all under my name. And um, yeah, there's, there's the information regarding the uncontrollable child. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mattis. you help your brother when you see him fall why do we act like god don't see it all why do we call them black them white them asians and use labels now that's racism
This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.